Hey, how are you guys doing? Just want to go through a summary of Romans 4 through 7, chapters 4 through 7, and what Paul was dealing with at the time and how it affects us and applies to us today. So, Father, I thank you for this opportunity to share your word. And, Lord, that you would, uh, we would see the God of the Bible, not the God that we want to be in the Bible. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. The church in Rome during Paul's time was diverse, but Paul's letter primarily addresses issues pertaining to the Christians who were ethnic Jews. He opens by con continuing his point that he had a discussion with or a letter with uh, about Abraham, and he was Abraham was the first Jew, and even he was declared righteous. Got a little itch there. Because of his faith in Yahweh, not because he kept the law. In fact, the law didn't even exist while Abraham was alive. It was a, until 430 years later. So how did he get his saving faith? Was it by being circumcised? No. His faith preceded his circumcision. If he had to do something to receive the faith, then it wouldn't be for free. It was something he had to earn. If it was just like that, it wouldn't be for free. So he received righteousness and faith as an uncircumcised man. Then the same thing can happen for the Gentiles. In fact, the word faith literally, literally translated in the Greek, in the, Hebrew, uh, in, the old, in the in the in the Bible means trust. He trusted God to the point of even saying. If, if God asked me to kill my son, which he did, Isaac, he will either raise him from the dead or provide at the time of the sacrifice another sacrifice. And that's what he, he trusted God. That was his faith. He trusts. In today's age, it's hard to trust anything and everyone because the trust has been broken so many times. And yet, you know, we know that that's wrong inside when someone breaks our trust, we know it's wrong. If, if I lied to you, that would bring you great joy, wouldn't it? And you found out? I don't think so. But we know consciously in, in our being what is right and wrong. Um, the same thing happened for the Gentiles. It can happen for the Gentiles if it happened for Abraham. He wants them to embrace the Gentiles as Abraham's offspring, as God's family. Though Jesus hadn't been born yet, and Abraham didn't know the particulars of Jesus' incarnation, crucifixion, and resurrection, he responded to what he knew of Yahweh. And according to Yahweh, who exists outside of time, even though Jesus hadn't been born yet, when Abraham died, Jesus had already died on the cross because that was the eternal plan. God loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus came because we were helpless and hopeless. The plan was that we were, we were going to fail God. We were going to break his law. That wasn't the plan. That was what God knew was what was going to happen. So the plan was that Jesus Christ, his only begotten son, would take on not only the physical pain, the punishment, mockery, um, betrayal of those he came to save, but he took on the wrath of God for us as a substitutionary sacrifice. We were to be punished. In fact, in a, in a uh, uh, court of law, God's justification is, is absolutely correct to punish us for sin. And the accuser of the brethren, would, which is Satan, would go to God, could go to God and say, hey, James, he sinned today. He failed. Why don't you kill him? And God would be just in doing so. But God did an awesome thing. He said, uh, son, would you be willing to take on my, the punishment of those that we love and created so that as my wrath is thrown upon you, when they ask for forgiveness of their sins, when they commit them, I will be faithful and I will be just to forgive them because of the penalty was already paid for. So God doesn't send us to hell. It's the consequence of sin that sends us to hell. God wanted to rescue us 
from hell. He wants to rescue us from all of that. In fact, we have insecurities here. We have failures here. We can't measure up to the law here. He wants to set us free here and then have eternity for free with him. Jesus had already died on the cross before the world was made. It was always the plan. Being justified, being that we're declared righteous, is Christ ends. The, in Christ ends the hostility between us and God. Our sin is the problem. But when our sins are covered, past, present, future sins, we have good standing with the Father. And because of that, we can rejoice even in our sufferings. We take on, Jesus said that as you follow me, you will bear the sufferings that I have gone through. People are going to lie to you, betray you. They might even beat you or kill you for my name's sake. But suffering in the long run for eternity produces endurance, which we'll need because suffering always lasts longer than what we want it to. If we never had to suffer, We'd be insufferable. But as we suffer, God develops character in us, which leads us to hope. And not just hope in anything, but hope in the glory of God. God is being glorified and made known in our suffering. God can be trusted with our suffering, just as he can be trusted with our sin, just like the man who is paralyzed and set near the pool of Bethesda, waiting to get into the pool where the angel was stirring the water and healing was actually provided for the first person who entered the water. And for 38 years, he tried to get into the water, even with help from other individuals, but could not get in. For 38 years, that was almost a lifetime of suffering and pain. And yet we look at people who go through that and we judge them, well, they're just not doing things right. Well, according to the salvation message, God took on all of that. And sometimes that long enduring process of suffering is building in us character. Or if we refuse God, it will build in us more bitterness and more brokenness. But he wants us to turn to him so that that suffering he can save us from. He can rescue us us helpless and hopeless people. And just as he can be trusted with our sin. So he looked at the, Jesus came in the, the area of the pool of Bethesda and he looked at the man, he says, do you want to be saved? And I'm like, why did you know he's there? Why he are not saved, but healed. And he goes, oh, I'm thinking to myself, why does he ask him if he wants to be healed? Because sometimes we can live in such a, a mind funk, F-U-N-K, a mind, a way of thinking because of our circumstances that we are not thinking the way the Bible teaches us to think about ourselves, about other people. And so Jesus is clarifying, do you want not only to be healed, but do you want to trust in me that I can heal you and change your life? And of course says, Lord, you know, I want to be healed. And he says, well, then stand up, take, pick up your mat and walk away. And the man did. So Jesus came to set right what was destroyed by God's enemies, which is Satan, and set in motion by Adam, who co-signed all to death. Now, there is no other religion on this planet where the God of that religion has come down and took our punishment for us. And then because or what they do is they say, hey, if you reach this, if you can do this, if you can achieve this, then you'll get your blessing and you have eternal life. That's not what our Jesus did for us. Jesus took upon that wrath for us. So the second Adam, which is Jesus, came to bring life. It doesn't seem like one man could accomplish that. But isn't a one, it's not a one-to-one -one trade. An imperfect man could, could die to pay for his own sins. But what if a perfect God man came? How many sinful human beings can be covered by the blood of a perfect God? As many who accepts it. By the one man's obedience, by one man's obedience, 
the many will be made righteous and right standing. Many. You and I are the many. And because his blood covers you and I, sin, you can't sin or I can't sin our way out of it, out of this mercy, out of this grace. Where sin increases, grace abounded all the more in Romans chapter 5.20. In other words, if your sin is a valley and his grace is a mountain, and you could push that mountain into the valley, it'd still be a mountain. But his grace is no reason to continue in sin. We may struggle, but we're no longer enslaved to that struggle. By the Spirit's power in us, we're continually killing off the old self. You know, we're not going to go to hell for smoking, but smoking can damage our body and even to the point of death. Same with drinking, same with overeating. You know, putting other people down is mocking God. So we fight those things and we want to change those things. It may be easy to fall back into our old patterns, but sin isn't worth it. What fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed of? Most people are ashamed. Most people are insecure. I would be, I shouldn't even use the word most, all people are dealing with a level of shame, even if they don't recognize it. All people are dealing with insecurities. All the people are dealing with fear. All people are dealing with failure. And the fruit of sin brings the shame. It's the fruit. It's a, it's a consequence of what, we, uh, of what we were born into. The fruit of righteousness, on the other hand, cleans us. It's, it sanctifies us. That's what clean means. It erases every blemish and gives us eternal life. All of this could make it seem like Paul hates the law. But he says in Romans, it's helpful. It taught him what sin is. We all have this ability and recognize what is wrong. But then the law actually points out it in detail. We need to know we are sinners. Without God, we're filthy, filthy rags. In the Old Testament, it says our righteousness, our good works, is like filthy rags, which is described in the Old Testament as a uh, material that is used to clean up the monthly menstrual period of a woman. And that's how God is telling us that our good deeds, we could work for the Salvation Army, the Peace Corps, give to the poor, but if we don't have the blood of Jesus over us, it's, it's just that filthy rag thing. But when Jesus' blood and righteousness covers us, metaphorically his blood, but his righteousness covers us because his blood was shed for us, then our good works are worth everything because we are no longer boasting about ourselves, but we are boasting in the fact that Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again. And that it is his good works that are going out. And because those works are going out, those works are going to be fruitful for eternity. And But as sinners, we want to push back on boundaries and laws. So while the law helps us, it is also provokes our pride. That's one reason the law can never be an end unto itself. It invites more problems than it should ever solve or could ever solve. So Paul lives in the struggle between the old self and the new self, between the flesh and the spirit. In those circumstances, he looks past the surface desires, his fleshly desires, the things that are on top that just pass by, but to see what his heart, not his flesh, what does his heart really want? His heart wants to be free. His heart does not want to be a slave to sin. His, wants, his heart wants to feel the joy and the freedom. What is his true desire? the one that will last for eternity. That's his true desire. The other desire will be fruitless and produce shame. He digs down to find what's in his inner being, the part of him that delights in God. So Jesus, our Lord, was delivered up for our trans trespasses, our sins, our transgressions, our iniquities, which is the consequence 
of our sin. And he was raised for our justification. God made us justified in Romans, and it says this in Romans chapter 4, verse 25. Not only does Christ's death, not our works, but his death saves us. Our sins aren't counted against us. We got grace and mercy. We got forgiveness and adoption. When the accuser of the brethren, I don't know if I've said this already, I'll just say it one more time, goes to God and says, James has failed, punish him. Jesus looks at God and says, but you eradicated and made a way through me to make the law, your justification, excuse me, this way. You've already justified. Um, your justification is satisfied by your wrath being put upon me. And so you can be faithful and just to forgive them of their sin. You can be faithful, trusting, and um, justified. You don't have to follow the old law because the new law eradicates it. We got our sins erased and our lives restored if we trust in the Lord. It takes time to grow in the Lord. It takes time to get things right. And we may fall back into some of the old patterns, but he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin if we'll ask him and turn our life over to him. Just, not just the absence of punishment that we get to enjoy, but the presence of blessing. What a savior that we have. He's the only savior in this whole wide world and from beginning of time to now that took upon the judgment of God and the fleshly punishment death overcame it and rose again no other religion no other god has done that it's all about what man can do to earn his own freedom and salvation but man is hopeless and helpless in accomplishing that on his own so jesus is where the joy is he's where our joy is so father i thank you for the scriptures i thank you for your word help us lord to continue to know and understand who you are and what your word is saying about you, and not what we think is saying about you, but who you really are in the word. In Jesus' name, and everybody, well, whoever's listening wants to say amen. That is great. Um, saying about you, but who you really are in the word. In Jesus' name. So you have a great amen. week and weekend, and I will talk to amen. you guys or great. share some more um, a little bit later. Thank you. You really are.